Hello, my name is Jared Ludlow, Publications Director at the BYU Religious Studies Center, your weekly resource for gospel scholarship. And today we'll talk about some possible resources that can accompany your Come Follow Me reading for March 20th through 26th, Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapters 8 and 13. The first article is called Names of the Parables, and it's by Thomas Waymont, a classics professor here at BYU, and it comes from a religious educator article. In this, he looks at the history of the interpretation of the parables and connecting them with the names that are given to them, because often the names influence what we take away from the parables and how we interpret them. And so he looks at the origins of some of these names and tries to determine why they're called what they are, and if maybe some of them would be better with a different name uh, because of the focus or emphasis that we're trying to get across. He gives one example of a name of a parable that we often call the parable of the marriage of the king's son, and this is in Matthew 22. But if, when we look at the story, perhaps the parable could be more appropriately named the parable of the invited guests, or equally as likely the guests who refuse to attend. And there's even another possibility, because the parable ends with the account of one of the guests being thrown out because he does not have on the proper wedding garment. If this portion of the parable were the main point or focus, perhaps a name such as the wedding garment parable uh, would be more appropriate. The point here is not to question endlessly you know, the names of the parables, but to recognize that uh, with a different point of emphasis, we might have a different name uh, attached to the parable. Now, in the New Testament itself, he points out, only two parables are given names by Jesus. One is the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, and one by the disciples, the parable of the tares in the field, also in Matthew 13. And so those are ones that are given anciently, whereas all the other names that we commonly refer to these have been given over time. And so he talks about particularly three parables and goes into a little more depth of where their names came from and, and maybe some other possibilities. And he talks about the wheat and the tares, the laborers in the vineyard, and the prodigal son. Because, for example, the prodigal son actually talks about two sons, not just one. And so he concludes with the thought that, though not intentionally deceptive, the names of the parable set the stage for both our interpretation and subsequent application. Many feel that the application of a parable need not be responsible to the original intent and interpretation of the parables. However, our modern application of the parables can be greatly informed by their original context and purpose. The second article is called Of Soils and Souls, The Parable of the Sower. It's by Jared Halverson, who's now a religion faculty member here at BYU. And it also comes from a religious educator article. So he, as the title points out, focuses on one particular parable, uh, the parable of the sower. And he points out that it ranks first in some respects. Chronologically, it's the first one that comes in the order of delivery. And Elder James E. Talmadge points out that it deserves first place among productions of its class. The primacy of this parable, however, goes beyond chronology and composition. It's also the repetition and explanation that comes with it. It's also one of the three parables that's repeated in all three synoptic Gospels. Similarly, it is one of the few parables for which the Lord himself included a detailed interpretation, which again all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, make sure to include. As Jesus later explained to his disciples, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Evidently, the Master considered this particular parable a mystery the disciples could ill afford to misunderstand. It's interesting also, he points out, that the prophet Joseph Smith interpreted the parable of the sower at length, connecting it to the other parables of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13. And he places all of them in a specific historical context. So for the rest of the article, he talks about the parable's content, the Savior's objective in telling it, and also, you know, what kind of wider uh, intended application it might have, one that can affect how we do our ministry today, the same way that the Savior originally intended it to affect that of his disciples. And so he connects this parable of the sower with other parables of the kingdom, as Joseph Smith does, 
He also talks about the four different soils and the effects that the weeds or the Word of God had on them. He even includes a helpful chart that lays that out. But then he also points out, you know, how firm were these, were these lines and how fixed were they meant to remain? You know, was it meant to be a final judgment or just present conditions? Uh, and so I like the point that he makes that it's not final decrees, but preliminary diagnoses of people's hearts and reactions to the Word of God. And so, as we come along, we can plow and hope that hearers of the Word can change and can overcome their initial reactions to the Gospel, and they can progress towards becoming the good ground. And so there's a lot more we can learn and study about this parable, and maybe we can understand better Elder Talmadge's words that we can find the living kernel of gospel truth within the husk of this simple tale.